sought after inspirational speaker, best selling author, and the founder of the Axiom Institute. She has served as both a teaching fellow at the Harvard Divinity School and research fellow at the Langer Mindfulness Lab. Maureen has been guiding ad- others through their transformative journey since 1996 after she experienced a spiritual awakening initiated by her intensive study of A Course in Miracles. She has since served as a counselor and a spiritual teacher, helping those in the midst of life's greatest pains to find greater fulfillment, inner peace, and miraculous healing. Let us welcome Maureen Whitehouse. and everything good that happens here all the time, the miraculous things that happen here all the time. So I'm going to begin just by reading the very first thing that's in this book called The Course in Miracles. And, and um, you can see, this is my baby. <laughs> had it for a long time. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. But I'd like everybody just to open your heart and listen with your heart these words how important and impactful they are. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. And right under that, I have a passage from the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita. The unreal never was, and the reality never ceased to be. Same, same. (laughs) So you can see that uh, this is the perfect course for you here in the ashram because you're right on the same path. So I have good news for you. The best thing about miracles is the one who relaxes the most wins. True. So think about this. When you were born, Think about the day you were born. You might not remember it. It might not be something that's in your awareness. But I'm sure if you talk to anyone that was present, everyone knew you were a miracle. Think about yourself. Think about any newborn baby. And think about where you came from. Just moments before that, before your first breath. You came in with your first breath spirit and then your physical being took that in and graced us all here with your presence and you'll go out with your last breath where do we go where do we go nothing unreal exists so why do you think you came did anything change from that first day you were born Other than that, we get ourselves enculturated into something that's our human condition. But in reality, the reality, that's the only thing that exists. We came here because we're the miraculous. We came here as the divine. And we came here to put on these wonderful costumes for a period of time to dream an impossible dream an absolutely impossible dream, that we could be separate from the divine, that we could not be divine. And what does it look like? So now we have all these people all over the world, billions of people, with all 
all different kinds of diverse ideas and, and looks and feelings and everything about them is diverse. And every single person on the planet is experiencing what it feels like to think you could be separate from the divine. And so because as that miracle baby, when we're brought into the world, everyone doesn't say, welcome to an illusion, a vast illusion. It's hilarious here because people forgot who they are. Everybody forgets who they are. But something inside never, ever, ever lets us forget. There's something inside of all of us. And A Course in Miracles calls that the voice for God, the Holy Spirit. And that's because it's that first breath we came in with. Spirit doesn't have form. Breath doesn't have form until we embody it. And we come in with that first breath. And we come here to play, to play a game, and to see what it would feel like if we could actually bring ourselves back where we came from, even while here in a body. So can you see now all the things that you've been doing here, uh, especially for the people who are in uh, the teaching program, what you've been doing and what's so valuable about that? Because you can be messengers for the reality just doing yoga postures, just choosing to do something that centers us on grace, just choosing to do anything we do that centers us back on who we really are every day, all day, can affect other people. So I like to see how many people here believe that they're um, a miracle worker? Interesting. Okay, good, good. So I got some brave people who are willing to say it, but I venture to say that you all are, and you just haven't known it yet. So now you're just going to claim and own your true identity so that it can start to be a lot more comfortable here. Because as A Course in Miracles says, there's only one problem and one solution. Forgot who you are forgot that you are the right hand man, woman to God. So no matter what's happening here and the crazier it gets, the greater the call for love, the greater the call to awaken. And that just means that more and more and more of us have to awaken now. So had someone said that to me 20 years ago, 22 years ago exactly, I would have thought well, that's just something for special people to awaken while you're here on the planet because I didn't know enough about it. I actually didn't know much at all about yoga. I didn't know how to meditate. I didn't know much of anything. I only knew one thing. I was in pain. And my own life really looked like a, um, a picture-perfect life. I've said this story before, but uh, I, I love the way it leads up to me being this like absolutely normal person who really was stumbling around in unconsciousness, but knew that that wasn't for me. And yet I had no idea what consciousness was or how to get there. I just knew that I couldn't pretend anymore in the world the way it was that I could do this and, uh, and, and make it. So I started like a spiritual path a long time ago when um, I found the book A Power of Positive Thinking on a table in my parents' home when I was just graduating college. And I studied to be an oceanographer, but didn't have money for grad school. And so instead of going to grad school right away, I went, I became a teacher, a science teacher, because they were in great demand, and I had the science background. So I was in the classroom yet again, and my heart and my mind was on the ocean, but I now became a science teacher. 
And so I had fun with the kids. It was science, so for me that was really fun. We blew up things. We did, you know, we got them outside as much as possible to take pond samples of the water and things, just so I wasn't in the classroom. But then I started feeling that nagging thing, like, is this all there is? Like, I like this, but this doesn't feel like the life I'd like to live. And I found the book, The Power of Positive Thinking, on a table in my parents' home. When I started to read it, the first thing I read was that your, your thoughts affect your life. And that's so elementary. Now you can see how I didn't know anything. And I thought that was incredible information. You're, you mean to tell me that what I think is going to affect what I live? And so I started to read it like voraciously. And I started to go to the beach because it was summertime and I was waitressing in, in the evenings to make money to, to maybe hopefully go to grad school sometime soon. And I started to really do what it said. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. He was, Norma Vincent Peale was a minister at the Marble Collegiate Church in New York City. And, um, and so I started doing it and feeling really powerfully positive. And I was watching all these things start to be much more happy than they had been before. And so just a little snapshot of what happened. These people came, saw I was started to get in great shape just because I wanted to be healthy. I started to run every day on the beach and I was riding my bike and I had been in the swim team in college so I started to swim. And some a husband and wife came up to me one time on the beach and said, hey, we want to take some stock photo pictures. Can we take some pictures of you like with sunsets and things? I said, sure. So they did. And I wasn't the type of person that would have ever done that. That was not, my, I was much too shy and embarrassed. But I did it because I was listening to Norman Vincent Peale. Then I went to the Rhode Island Model Agency, because this was University of Rhode Island I was going to and teaching around. And I went to get paid, and the woman was on the phone when I walked in, and she looked at me and said, you're perfect. You're the right height, and you're the right shape. You, you'll, you're perfect. And I said, for what? And she said, they just had somebody who did all the preliminaries for Miss Rhode Island, can you stand in? And I panicked. I was much more like an ashram person than even though I didn't know that. <laughs> and so I didn't have high heels, I had earth shoes. I wasn't the kind of person that ever even watched the Miss America pageant or any of that stuff, it, to, except to like laugh. And with my brother and his friends. And, and so I wound up not telling anybody and going for the preliminary because I was too embarrassed to tell anybody. And I had to buy high heels on the way. I had to buy my gown at like Filene's basement when in Boston when it was still a only store Boston basement. And it wound up being this like major designer gown that I didn't even know until I got there. And I wound up winning that because I'm on the stage literally thinking, I can do all things through Christ that strengthen me while, while I'm doing this because I didn't know what I was doing except doing what Norman Vincent Peale told me. So a few months later, I have a leap of absence from my junior high science class, and I'm going to the Miss America pageant with my boyfriend taking my job as a teacher, a science teacher, because he was a phys ed major. So I'm off, everybody's all set back in Rhode Island, and I wound up becoming a runner up and going to New York City to model. So my boyfriend got my job, he was happy, <laughs> everybody was happy, and I'm in New York City now. The only thing was is that I had never taken pictures before, and again, that was something that in my world I was shy and I thought that was kind of vain. But here I am now vying for jobs and things where people were professionals at this. So I started doing everything the book said and continued into this career, but I like ditch off into churches or into places where I could just light candles or do something in between appointments because I felt like this was a really overwhelming business and everything was very much superficial in a world that I wasn't used to. But I stuck with it for quite a while. I wound up 
traveling and going to Europe. And as, as the, I grew and had children and became a wife and mother, I became the wife and mother on commercials. And I had on my resume, great with dogs and kids. And so everybody wanted me to be doing things that had to do with the young mom. I never knew that I'd have that job for that long because when I first began, the only models that were models were 15 to 18. Brooke Shields was the first model that was like 15 year old. They dress her up and look like a 30 year old and that was the standard. So here I am years later and all of a sudden it hit me again. Not kind of all of a sudden, but it was, this, it was coming along. And I just said, I don't understand this. I'm on commercial sets all the time, so I was really good. I'm very observant. So I got really good at making the perfect house with the, you know, I even had the white picket fence that I painted myself. And then my kids were beautiful. The dog was groomed perfectly. Everything looked like perfection. I got so good at this, I could outdo Martha Stewart any day. And uh, really, truly. And since it looked so good on the outside, everybody thought I was happy. And I didn't understand if I did it so well, and I have these, you know, now great jobs. I was in Boston at this time, and that was easier for me to work coming from New York and, and Europe. So I had a very successful career. And yet it started again that I'm not what's happening. So I got to the point where I had read over those years because I was so uh, kind of obsessed with self-help books after the power of positive thinking and you know how it got my life to change. I pretty much read everything that was available at the time. And at that time it wasn't like today. The bookshelf for self-help was about this big. The bookshelf for spirituality was like one shelf in the bookstore. But I was between auditions one day in Boston and I wound up at this little bookstore that I used to love to stop in because I was used to going to places that were my sanctuary between auditions and appointments. And this bookstore was called Hori San. I found it had just closed recently. And it was a, a metaphysical bookstore, really beautiful people who were uh, disciples of Ramana Maharshi. And uh, so I went in and I was browsing and I saw the same kind of books that I'd seen before. And then as I turned, there was a little bookshelf over on the side and I saw this book that was sort of beaming at me. And I really didn't know what that was, but I, I, kinda, I was kind of scared of it. So I kept over there, I looked again through all the other books and I had seen almost everything. And that book over there really captured my attention. So I walked over to it. That's this book. And I opened it up. And it fell open. I have so many bookmarks in here now that they are rendered useless. <laughs> but it fell open to a page that said, I am not my body. I am not a body. I am free. For I am still as God created me. And I just stood next to that bookshelf and I started to cry because that was what I felt I was. I, you know, I was like a clothes hanger when I was a model and I had that, you know, everything about my beautiful home was because I was oriented towards the superficial or the physical. Every bit of performance I was performing for everybody in my world, everybody you know, white and smiling for the commercials. And, and I didn't realize it was because I felt I was a body and then to get hit between the eyes with that. So I took it home. I bought the soft cover. I didn't even spring for the hard cover. <laughs> and now it's all taped and things. But I put it on the shelf in the living room and I started to, you know, just every so often look at it and say, I gotta read that someday but it still scared me. And then one day I did decide I'd sit down and read it. And when I read it and opened it up, <clears throat> I opened it up to the very first lesson. And the first lesson is, talks about this table is not a table. Everything you see in this room, 
everything before you is not what you think it is. And that really freaked me out. So I looked at the back of the book, and this is an old version, so it doesn't even have, there's no author on it. It says Foundation for Inner Peace. There's no way to get a hold of anybody. So I said, okay, good, so it's not a cult. They can't like get me mind trained or something because so I can continue to read this. But what I did is I shoved it under my couch and hid it so that no one would see it because the impact of when I started to read it was so profound that I didn't want anyone making fun of me or I was, you know, I was a commercial actor. And here I am reading, I'm not a body, I'm still as God created me. And so even though it rang true to, in every part of my being, I still hid it, didn't show my husband, and went about life as normal as usual. And yet, I started to do the lessons. There's 365 lessons in A Course in Miracles. <clears throat> and I started to do them to try to do them to perfection. So if, if by chance it says in a lesson, you know, go out and see everyone as the light of the world today, if I didn't see everyone as the light of the world, I did the lesson over. And I did it over, and I did it over. So it didn't take me 365 days. It took me about three years, three and plus years. And I still didn't tell anybody. No one knew. So about halfway through, I got to this point where I said, you know, this is ridiculous. I'm, I'm really not very good at this. I started to observe myself more. And the more I observed myself, the more crazy I thought I was. Because I would lose my temper. At, things like tr in traffic, and I wasn't being the Christ that the book is telling me to be. But I kept going, because it would say not to judge and, and to forgive things and forgive yourself. And then it said, listen for the voice for God. So I said, well, if this is real, then I'm just going to have to ask, you know, teach me what this means, because I really am not understanding this. And I started to hear more deeply. Now what that is is that all of us have a mystical tendency. We all do. If someone's not listening to their true self, it sounds like a nagging voice. It sounds like your conscience, you know, the kind that they put the devil and the angel on the shoulder. It sounds to us like we are being um, maybe admonished if we put our own spin on it. But the voice for the divine never admonishes. You know this if you've watched in yourself in meditation. The most it would ever say that is disparaging is, you perfect, holy child of God. And that's really hard to hear when you're not liking yourself, you know? You don't really believe it yet. It's kind of, it can be really, really pissed you off. And so I'm hearing this more and more and more. And I started to write down when I was hearing it. Every time, I, you know, I think I wasn't enough, like I'm not good enough. I hear enough, enough. You are enough to move mountains. And I hear things like that. And I started writing them and they were beautiful, like poetry, but I didn't show anybody. I thought that was like a little weird, Maureen. And so I hid those too. And then pretty soon it got too hard to hide. Not that I told anybody, but my discontent got hard to hide. And my not fitting in got hard to hide. I'm still you know, working in a very superficial world, doing things that seem pretty superficial. So I got to the place, A Course in Miracles uses the path of forgiveness. It uses your very own life, wherever you are, and over and over and over it says to, you can see this differently. You can see this differently. It says it very kindly, you can see it differently, and you're like, how? I only see what I see in them. I don't like that. And it uses forgiveness. So when you can forgive yourself, for seeing what you're seeing, all of a sudden you start to see differently. So I started to forgive everyone in my world. I worked through the list. And I realized after a while, well, you know, that was just my way of seeing that. 
And now, I got left with one person. I'd already gone through all the lessons. I was sad because I didn't feel like I got this. And I realized I had to forgive myself. Because I was the only one that could perceive what I was perceiving in order to live the dream and the world I was living. No one else was responsible for that because no matter what's going on in front of you, it's how you perceive it. And so I didn't at that time know why I was forgiving myself, but I knew it was time for me to forgive myself. And so I was alone again in my living room. I got on my knees in front of a chair and I said, Maureen, I forgive you. I really didn't say it with my head. I said it with all of me because I didn't know exactly what I was forgiving myself for. I just knew it was an imperative. And in that moment, I, I really felt an elation. I felt a lightheartedness because it dawned on me, wow, you never have to do that again. You never have to imagine that you know what anything is. Like really, literally, you know nothing. And the thought of that didn't get me angry. It actually made me feel really happy because I didn't have to know anything. And with that, it meant I didn't even have to perform because what would I be performing? If I didn't know anything, how could I do anything right or wrong? So I went through the rest of the day pretty happy then. It left me pretty carefree because I didn't really have to do anything but what was in front of me then, which is presence. I didn't know that, but I was realizing that this is really fun. All I have to do is what's in front of me and everything else is going to be okay. And that night then, my husband was out of town, and at that time, I was a very scared person. On top of all the other things, I was very scared. Like, the remember the kids across the street were teenagers, had motorcycles, they scared me. So at night, when my husband was out of town, I put a pair of scissors under the bed, the dog was perched near the window, the kids were in bed with me, and they were small at the time. And I went to bed that night pretty happy, and I woke up, I remember it was 3 o'clock in the morning because I had some cramps in my stomach, and I, I'll talk about that later on, about what that is. And I looked at the clock, and I saw it was 3 o'clock in the morning. And in the past, that would have really bothered me because if I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning and my husband wasn't there and I was alone in the house, I would have been scared all night. I wouldn't have gone back to bed. But I looked at the clock, it was 3 o'clock in the morning, I felt a little bit of something in my stomach and I laid there and I just said, well, I believe in miracles, now heal this. And the moment I said that, I went shooting out of my body and into the heart of God. Now, I could never have said that at the time because it was being in that state of absolute and I, I've never, ever known that, that it wasn't my inclination to read those kinds of books on anything that was like that, or I didn't even know I had ever seen any mystical literature or things like that to have even imagined this. And I wound up in what felt like uh, the, uh, the softest down comforter of love soft and complete and I didn't I couldn't think not a thought can reach that and so what I this is in retrospect because there was nothing but allness I started to come down through layers and as I came through layers I had all kinds of visions and things but the most significant that changed my life from there on ever after was that I had the classic near-death experience then. And so I started to see my life go before my eyes. And I realized I was experiencing judgment day, judgment day, the thing that everybody gets so mixed up in, in some religions. And what judgment day was was that I was watching what I had judged wrongly. So all of the pain that I ever had experienced in my life, 
every pain, you know, things that were real challenges, miscarriages, things like that, that I had had that really rocked my experience. I now saw them through the eyes of the divine. And when I saw them, each thing I saw was hilarious. It was hilarious because I realized I forgot I was God. It, even though it was painful at the time, when I watched it, it was like, Maureen, see what you just did? You said this. You did that. Look at this. Look at this. And I saw all these things as hilarious, and it, and it felt like this rolling thunder of laughter was going on with me as I'm watching it. And I heard, now you see how I see. Now you see how I see. And it was like, uh, as if it was Moses' burning bush. It was like that. And so I came out of that experience in the morning with a, with a gasp. Like, just in, I was in bed. I see the kids in bed. And I didn't realize it till after, you know, I then studied the Hindu tradition and things to, because I didn't know what happened to me. For the longest time. But I did find out that that was the breathless state. I went breathless at 3 o'clock in the morning and came out of it at 7 o'clock in the morning. That's when your mind is completely still. There's no thought. And I came back to my body in the bed with the kids who have to go to school. And I'm on fire. I was on fire. And so I got out of the bed, and the bathroom was just over there. So I walk into the bathroom to think I'm going to splash water on my face to compose myself. And when I came up and looked in the mirror, I saw myself without a body. I saw myself as a spirit looking at me. And I have to tell you, I have been a model, an international fashion model, for how many years now by that time? Like, 10 years, and I never saw anything as beautiful as this. And I have seen the most beautiful people on earth. And this being is looking back at me with golden eyes that were loving me so intensely that I, I nearly fell down. And I thought, uh, that didn't work. And I got myself back to the place where I'm trying to think to bring the kids to school, but I couldn't think. My mind wasn't thinking, so I was doing what I could do that was like rote, but I'm watching as I bring them to, to get breakfast. How exquisite it is to watch kids make cereal for themselves. And everything I was seeing was happening amplified by about 10,000. So I bring them to school and I'm seeing love meeting love and love leaving love instead of parents only. I went to get a card. I had to get like a birthday card for somebody. I went to Kmart and I'm nearly falling on my knees in Kmart because I get to the, to the cards and I'm realizing Somebody dropped their kids off at school to go right to get to there to, to draw this picture, to get this here. And I'm watching the trucks. I'm watching everything that happens to bring us a card. I couldn't go food shopping. I couldn't do anything without realizing the, the connectedness of everything in the world. And it was blowing me away with realization of what we miss. I, I see somebody with their shopping cart moving across the other person with the shopping cart and I'm thinking, you smile, smile. You didn't realize you just did that. You did that, you set that up so that you'd both walk past each other. I remember I had to go into the craft store to get something for the kids to make something with. I walked into the craft store and there was a mother with a girl in a wheelchair that had two buttons. One said yes and one said no. And I walked down the aisle and I couldn't keep my eyes off of her because she was exquisite. And I thought, I never saw before. She's the wise one. She's the one who did this for her. 
she came into a body to pretend she had something broken so she would be able to love more. I never imagined how we see everything backwards. So I wound up that way for three days. Three days where I couldn't think. And little by little, I remember uh, the, the book. I went under the couch and got the book and I said, maybe I'll find out what this is if I look in the book. And I picked it up. And I went from, I only did the lessons of A Course in Miracles because I didn't understand the, the text. The text was way too complex for me. Because all the text says over and over and over again is love. Love, love. It uses lots of complicated words because it's trying to use our mind to beat the mind. And I didn't know that until I picked it up and I could understand every word. And I, I literally threw it down because that scared me. I, I saw and understood every word. And then I wound up opening up to this. This is the page it opened to. And I have to tell you, I do know, I mean, like I see this as, as, a, as a sacred text in the utmost because I've never opened it up where it didn't open right up to whatever needed to be said. I never did read the text. I just opened it up because I know it's telling me what I need to, to hear when I open then up to that page. So this is what it's read when I opened it up that day. Can you imagine how beautiful those you forgive will look to you? Remember, I forgave myself. In no fantasy have you ever seen anything so lovely. Nothing you see here, sleeping or waking, comes near to such loveliness and nothing will you value, value like unto this, nor hold so dear. Nothing that you remember that made your heart sing with joy has ever brought you even a little part of the happiness this sight will bring you. For you will see the Son of God. I see that as Son with an S-U-N because I see us as that brilliant. You know, that we don't realize how brilliant we are because we came here the ray of the sun. We cannot be disconnected from our source. That's impossible. That means we have every bit of power that God has. The only power we don't have is we can't recreate our creator. So that means we have an eternally loving being as our creator who said, you're mine. You're perfect. You can't leave home. But have at it. Try. And you'll decide you want to come back sometime. Because it doesn't feel that great to think you're separate. You will behold the beauty the Holy Spirit loves to look upon and which he thanks the Father for. So this has a lot of Christian terminology, of course, in miracles, which does turn some people off. And I like to just reinterpret that just as, you know, if, it's, if you're still judging anything, then you can't get perfect vision. So again, relax. The one who relaxes the most wins. Because if we're not judging, that's the only thing that keeps our vision cloudy. It's the only thing. If we can give up the judgment, judgment is projected outward at what's going on out there and guilt is projected inward same thing two sides of the same coin and I had no idea I was judging to that degree that I kept away heaven on earth so when I ask if you're miracle workers I, I really mean that because you are and if you're judging yourself as anything less then that means that you have to remember what you came here for. And I'll tell you, if you happen to be one of the people that watches the news these days, and if it ever upsets you, then that you forgot one problem, one solution. One problem is you thought you were a God. And one solution, remember now. Remember now.